Good morning. Thank you for coming out here to hear me speak today. And for those watching remotely, thank you. My name is Cameron Haar with Lawrence Livermore National Labs Livermore Computing Division. And uh, there I, I work on Lustre operations and do some IO strategy. So today I'm going to talk about a novel approach to, to procuring our, our storage using super micro equipment. So a little bit first about Livermore Computing, or, or LC as we like to call it. So LC is a division with, at, at the lab that manages our general HPC resources. And uh, we, we have a lot of resources. This, this slide's a little bit out of date, um, given the brand new top 500 list that just came out. But uh, we have six clusters in the, in the top 212, I believe. And um, we continue to grow. In fact, uh, our, our newest data center, which is only about five and a half years old, is due for a physical expansion in, in the next couple of years. And our flagship facility, the TSF, or Terascale Simulation Facility, is nearing completion of a major power and cooling upgrade. So that building, which houses Sierra and Lassen, several other uh, systems um, in the top 212, and uh, is getting ready for the incoming El Capitan Exascale system in a couple years. So that's being upgraded from an already large 45 megawatts to a whopping 85 megawatts. So that's enough to basically power 68,000 average American homes, so, so quite a bit. Now, besides hardware, LC also does software, a lot of which you've probably already used or at least heard of. So ZFS did not come out of LC, but we, we have a, uh, a big thumbprint on it. So Brian Bellendorf uh, sits down the hall for me. He's the, the uh, project lead for OpenZFS. So Slurm and SPAC um, and the new resource manager Flux that we're starting to use, all, all were uh, born and originally developed in LC. PDISH, PowerMan, ConMan, staples of HPC system administration came out of LC, and many more other packages. All right, so what are we going to talk about today? Well, at issue is the fact that it, as organizations grow, they tend to acquire you know, various different storage solutions. And as these, these solutions diverge, they, they tend to, to have costs. So in LC, we're taking a slightly different approach to procuring our storage and the, the servers and infrastructure that go with them. The way uh, we're, we're procuring with this now is we're trying to standardize our storage across different application domains for different purposes. And we're doing that using what we call the ASP contract, which I'll talk about in a minute. And so we'll go into to what's different, the what, the why, the how of, of this approach. We'll look at you know, what it looks like in LC, how we're using them. And uh, at the end, the snakes. So right, what, what's up with the snakes? <laughs> Um, I'll warn you up front, they have nothing to do with Supermicro. It's not a metaphor for Supermicro staff or processes or anything like that. Supermicro has been, been great to work with. But I'll, I'll touch on, on that at the end, what, you know, what the things have to do with it. Okay, so imagine you um, are tasked with procuring a new storage solution, right? What, what's your process for figuring out what, what you're going to get? There's, um, there's going to be differences in the way diff people approach it, but there's probably a lot of commonalities, right? You're definitely, you're, you're gonna define your, your minimum capacity, uh, you know, roughly define your performance needs, and uh, then maybe go with the latest and greatest from your incumbent vendor, or perhaps do some market research, see what's hot in the market for your application, go with that. Perhaps less common is to go down the hall and ask you know, other teams in your organization, hey, you know, what are you using? And then going with that, right? Uh, it can be hard to line up timelines and budgets, technical needs across, across teams and applications. So it can be hard to, to standardize um, that, that storage. In LC, we've tried to do that before, but again, it can be difficult to do so. And so we, we too have a lot of different uh, storage solutions in-house. One-offs or you know, different, um, different solutions per, per application. And uh, those differences create costs, right? So, most organizations have a finite number of staff. I, I'd like to meet one that, that doesn't. <laughs> we, we certainly do in LC. And when you have lots of different solutions and a finite number of staff, that results in silos of, of knowledge where it's really not possible for each person to, to know, all the, uh, you know all the ins and outs of each, each storage solution. So you end up with this matching game, right? So, okay, who knows the ESS or who knows the DDN? Who knows the NetApp, right? So it'd be, it'd be difficult to get that knowledge that you need. 
Okay, so now you've got these different solutions, right? You know, is, is it a big deal? You know, we're all used to, to, to dealing with it and diversity is good, right? Well, absolutely, right, for your staff. Um, you know, that's to be encouraged. But in, in hardware, maybe not so much. So r raise your hands. How many of you have a bin or a box at home full of obsolete cables, right? I know I certainly do, so, right? So, you know, all these differences in the end aren't always that great, right? They create the, these extra costs. But um, back to storage. So, you know, is it really that big of a deal to have all these different storage solutions? Well, I, I think there are costs that should be taken seriously, right? So with your different solutions, you're gonna have different inventories and even slight variations, right? A new, new dim speed or a new CPU spend. That's gonna require you to, to build your inventory while maintaining the existing inventory. There's, as we talked about in the last slide, you end up with these, these silos of knowledge and expertise, making it difficult to get the information you need. With each new solution, you need new training, right? And if those solutions are from different vendors, well, then you're, you, you're dealing with new support processes too, right? Different support teams, different tools, documentation, different portals, you know, you have to go to and ways of doing things. So all these carry costs. Plus, there can be real monetary costs. I know that for us with this uh, ASP approach, by standardizing on, on the same hardware, we've seen real uh, monetary savings um, by, by buying in, in volume. All right, so those are some of the costs. So does it make sense, you think, to, to reduce some of these disparities and, and standardize? Well, in LC, we, we think so, so we're, we're going forward. So let me reintroduce you to the ASP or the Adaptable Storage Platform. So the ASP is a five-year contract that uh, we put out for a competitive RFP process, a bid, last year. And that was won by Supermicro. In effect, the ASP gives us a menu of modules with, with which we can easily and, and efficiently uh, build storage systems to meet our capacity and performance needs. So uh, among these modules, I'll, I'll go over some of the main ones. There's an FBB or a flash building block that contains a couple of servers and uh, shared NVMe flash. There's a DBB or a disk building block, which is effectively an FBB with two attached JBODs. There's a management module for, with a couple of choices and uh, modules for your infrastructure, you know, top of rack ethernet switch, racks, PDUs, et cetera. And then there's, there's various other options to fine tune and, and tweak some of these, these larger modules to, to get what you need. Uh, I touched on this, really this, this allows us to really rapidly, <coughs> excuse me, rapidly um, procure a new storage and to, st to streamline that process. Those of you familiar with government procurement knows that there can be a, uh, there can be, you know, lots of processes, regulations to, to procurement. Excuse me. So now what we can do is quickly piece together a, con uh, a configuration, pass it by our team at Supermicro, and um, they'll uh, approve or correct it, and we can pass it on and, and get a purchase order. So it moves pretty quickly. Now, I, I mentioned, <coughs> excuse me, I mentioned this is a five-year contract. It also comes with a $20 uh, million cap. So whichever comes first, then we would, you know, move on to a new contract. But uh, to give you an idea of how useful this has been for us, we've already used over a quarter of this contract just in the last year. So it's been a real win so far for us. Okay, so... What exactly is different about the ASP, right? How does it, how does it help us? Well, we talked about how you end up, um, you know, when, when your system architects go and, and design an art, uh, a solution for a particular application, you end up with all these different solutions, come with different vendors, different inventories, and all these, these other costs, right? So the ASP really reduces these disparities down to one. One vendor, you know, one uh, proverbial throat to choke. <laughs> and. Uh, now, instead, we can quickly, you know, select the, you know, the um, you know, define your capacity performance needs and quickly select what meets your needs. So, for example, <clears throat> let's say you need a new Lustre system. You know, great. Are you going to be doing data on metadata or do you have a lot of small files? Well, <clears throat> then you're going to want more metadata servers, right? So add more FBBs and then fill out with DBBs until you hit your capacity uh, or budget target. Do you need a new archive disk cache? Well, great. You probably don't want to pay for the, for the IOP, for the cost of the NVMe flash, which you, you're really not going to use with you know, this slow tier of disk. Excuse me. 
So all you need to do is, is buy DBBs until you hit your capacity targets. You know, or do you need something else? Great, just mix and match those FBBs and DBBs till you hit, hit what you need. <clears throat> okay, so what does this equipment look like? Well, surprise, it looks like super micro gear. <laughs> Um, so the FBB is a 2U chassis with uh, two um, dual socket Intel Cascade Lake servers inside. Um, each of those uh, also has a uh, um, 100 gigabit Mellanox VPI adapter, meaning it can do into uh, Ethernet or InfiniBand. And they share up to 24 NVMe drives, and that's, that's PCIe Gen 3 uh, drives. For the management module, there's a couple of options. Each are one U, so you can get a one U chassis with two servers or a one U chassis with one server. In LC, we tend to use uh, two management nodes or, or more per cluster, and so we, we default to this twin server approach where we can, um, helps us manage our, our systems. For the 10 U DBB, you're effectively using the exact same FBB, but you also have two quad port SAS cards in each of those, those embedded servers. And uh, you may, then you have optional flash. Some people may not need the flash, uh, such as your, your disk cache. But um, we, this configuration gives us a couple of things. So the, uh, the added SAS cables and connections lets us maximize our bandwidth from the server to the JBOD. And also, it allows us to use flash in our volumes if need be. So in LC, we're using the new ZFS 2.1 uh, release, which um, lets you use DRAID or a large distributed RAID, RAID pool, um, ZRAID, right? And so in there, we're actually using NVMe flash as what, what are called special devices. In our configuration, we're getting about two usable petabytes per DBB, and, and remember, that's two enclosures. So depending on how you configure your, your disks, you can you know, get you know, roughly two petabytes per DBB. One artifact of this configuration is now you have four SAS paths to each hard drive. So that means with 180 hard drives, you're now looking at 720 enumerated SCSI devices in your operating system, which can slow things down a bit, right? Fortunately, these uh, JBOS from Supermicro support uh, zoning, various levels of zoning. So we have them configured um, each JBOD sees two zones. What that effectively does is it presents half of the drives to only half of the, the ports and the I.O. modules. And that has two effects. That uh, drops the number of enumerated SCSI devices in half, plus it allows um, the, the controller in, in the JBOD to aggregate I.O.s. So we did a little bit of testing with this. Um, we tested with the uh, XDD um, tool on top of ZFS, um, using one meg sequential writes. Um, now with no other tunings, just uh, zoning off or zoning set to two, we saw a 51% uh, performance boost in our writes. If you then uh, add some tunings, uh, some simple ZFS tunings that we're gonna be running in production, that goes up to 57%. So a significant uh, boost in performance if you're doing you know, larger sequential writes. All right, so you know, every solution, especially brand new solution, is gonna have, have bumps in the road. But uh, as I've said, there have been benefits come out of this, and there certainly have, and I can see us keeping on with this same approach in the future. Some things that uh, have been great, so we've seen a very low um, dollar per petabyte uh, cost with this, with this contract. Now obviously, with e any solution, any storage solution, over time, as, as you, you know, realize new densities, that, uh, that, that ratio of dollar per petabyte is gonna drop. And it, and it has, but it, we've seen a substantial, a substantial change here. I've mentioned we get really efficient ordering. It's really streamlined the process uh, where we can get a new order out in, on the order of days rather than weeks or months. At Supermicro, we actually have a great account team that we, we work with. We have um, bi-weekly calls, and, and that can be more frequent if need be, but now we're good with bi-weekly where on our team we've got you know, a salesman, we've got a, uh, a kind of a business development management team, or I kind of like to see them as, as project managers. They handle you know, the orders, make sure everything's things, uh, correct and verified, and they help us track issues. So we can go through each week and on all of our systems track uh, any issues that, that might have, have arisen. Now, kind of a little bonus, we happen to have a number of compute clusters also from Supermicro. So all of those fall under the same umbrella. So we can 
on this, this weekly call, we can cover all of our compute systems and our ASP systems together. And re again, really streamline that, that process of, of tracking any issues or future orders and such. One other bonus is Supermicro is only 45 minutes to an hour down the street, or I mean, it's Bay Area, so maybe two hours. <laughs> but um, so, so if we need be, it's easy to, to get together and, and, uh, and visit. Now, going into this whole thing, we knew there were going to be some risks, maybe some trade-offs, right? There, there always will be. So some of those that we, we kind of walked into, we knew that um, we're going with a new JBot, not just new for uh, Livermore, but new for Supermicro as well. Right, new, new hardware always takes a little bit to stabilize. We decided to go with uh, PCIe Gen 4 drives in Gen 3 slots. And uh, we figured they should be fully backwards compatible, so shouldn't be much of an issue. We realized that with you know, all these systems, remember we're standardizing now across many application domains, you know, if there's a real major systemic issue with one, well, maybe that could take down systems you know, across the board. Um, so we, we, we knew that was a risk. Then at a general uh, kind of higher level, I had a concern about, you know, Supermicro is not necessarily known as a systems integrator, you know, a systems level company where they can look at the operating system, um, you know, above just the hardware components, you know, look at, you know, file system and, and all those tunings. So that was a little bit of a concern. However, um, before we went into this, Supermicro had actually hired a, uh, a senior engineer from DDN that I had worked with previously. And uh, that assuaged our, our concerns, um, although we, we have kept them pretty busy. <laughs> Excuse me. All right. So despite all these risks, we have been bitten a couple of times, and I'm gonna I'm gonna go go over some of those. So, in, Intel's delays on the Ice Lake processor are, are well known, right? And because of those delays, we were forced to go with the Cascade Lake processors, which only support PCI Express Gen 3. Right, so now we're, you're, that greatly limits our, our, you know, the bandwidth we can we can expect. Um, on top of that, we figured, okay, no, you know, not a problem. We'll deal with it. Um, so we used these these Gen 4 drives, figuring they'd just work, but they didn't actually. In fact, uh, they often were not recognized at boot time, and this was this was a blocker for us. This caught, created serious issues and caused months, real months of, of delays. Um, eventually. Supermicro and then the manufacturer were able to replicate this issue and the manufacturer was able to get a hot fix firmware to us where we were able to disable one of the clocks and voila, we are able to see those uh, NVMe drives which we needed to see. Another issue with the drives is we found serious and, and repeatable discrepancies in performance where many of the drives would come up at half speed or even less. Again, um, Supermicro was able to replicate this, take it to the manufacturer, and then a fix for that should be in a, in a pending firmware as well. Moving on to the JBODs, um, something that, that hit us pretty hard and which you might think sh shouldn't be that big of a deal, was we would get these random um, slow, like order of magnitude slow responses to um, CES commands, uh, SCSI and closer service commands from our SNMP monitoring system. And they were slow enough that they would actually cause the uh, the servers to crash and go offline. So this was this became a blocker. This actually really impeded us. Um, the way we got around that was to disable our SNMP monitoring, which obviously is not an ideal long-term solution, right? Um, one other issue is, is uh, a sparse cache. So again, Supermicro is not typically hadn't been typically known as a you know systems integrator. They don't have large inventories of all these non um, Supermicro parts. So that means we have to RMA to, to manufacturers, and that was causing a problem. The uh, lead time to RMA and get new hard drives and, and such um, was, was becoming a, an issue. And so Supermicro resolved this already by um, giving us a large cache uh, in-house that we can use, and that hides any latency of going to the manufacturer. Okay, so how is LC using these systems? Well, so going into this whole ASP process, um, the main drivers were our HPSS, or archive disk cache, which uh, was pretty old, uh, getting old, and uh, we're running out of spares for it, and spare drives that we couldn't even procure anymore. So they needed a new solution. Um, at the same time, some of our current generation of Lustre systems are also starting to go out of warranty. So and we thought, hey, let's get together, find something that can work for all of us. So we did that, and along the way we found out that there's lots of other solutions that the same hardware could work great for. 
And so that, we, we took this, this standardizing or unification approach. Um, so on the Lustre systems, you can see, uh, we're using the FBBs as our, the servers in the FBB as our MDS nodes with the uh, flash configured in, in mirrors for our MDTs. Um, the DBBs, obviously, those servers are, are our OSS nodes. And as I mentioned before, we, we have uh, the storage configured in one OST or one giant pool per enclosure. Um, and the, the, the NVMe flash that's integrated into that operate as what are called special devices that are great for handling small files, small block I.O., and, and can optimize that. Um, for the disk cache, they don't need those extra IOPS, right? It's, it, that's a slow tier. And so they have no, none of the FBBs. They just bought straight DBBs um, to, to maximize their, their dollar value. And um, one unique thing that they are doing, though, is using Zvols, which uh, aren't that common. So Zvols is basically a volume on top of a, a ZFS pool that is then presented as a block device to, to the hosts. And so from what I hear from them, that's, go, that's serving them well. On top of this, some other applications are a Splunk cluster, where we use the servers in, in those FBBs and DBBs for searching and indexing nodes. Um, we've done a small NFS uh, server, like NFS on top of ZFS. Um, we've got a Globus endpoint we're, we're configuring and uh, a starfish cluster, and, and there's, there's almost an infinite you know, number of uses. Anything that requires storage, we can use this for, for. That's how versatile it is. So this slide shows you a little bit of, of you know, what we're going to be replacing with ASP storage. We have, you know, as, I, as I mentioned up front, we have a lot of different storage solutions. But um, kind of our more commodity stuff, we plan to replace with this ASP gear. So in that first column the, in the red, um, that's our, our existing um, luster and, well, yeah, our existing luster, which is about 75 usable petabytes. And then we have about 14 petabytes of archive disk cache. So all of that is, is getting replaced. And as we replace these, because of the, the, the benefits of the increased density um, and using 16 terabyte drives, we're able to boost um, each file system and, or disk cache store by about 50% or more in some cases. So you can see that, you know, the projection over time, you can see that, that growing. Um, then I've, in, in the green, I've, I've put a, you know, a conservative projection of, of extra, extra, you know, applications for this storage that we hadn't necessarily thought of up front. Um, you know, some of which I've mentioned, you know, Splunk or Globus or Starfish, which is a, a big metadata indexing uh, system. So those have served, served us well. All right. So... The snakes. What's up with the snakes, right? Well, it helped get you all here, so thank you. <laughs> but um, our Lustre generations, e each generation of Lustre hardware, we, we typically have a, a naming scheme. And for this, one of my colleagues suggested, hey, let's use snakes. I'm a big fan of snakes. So I'm like, that's a great idea. Let's hope it doesn't come back and bite us. And uh, so, so that's the reasoning behind the snakes. And each of the systems, so each of the snakes that have, have been shown here in this presentation are representative systems that we already we have ordered or will be uh, ordering in the near term. And uh, I don't know if anybody wants to raise their hand and take a, take a stab at, at naming the snakes, but uh, showed you an, an asp, a, uh, you know, a boa, a bull snake, a racer, a mamba, garter and gopher snakes here. So fan of, fan of those snakes. All right, so I want to say thank you to all of you online or here in person for attending this, this presentation. And I want to give a thanks uh, to the Department of Energy for paying for the work that we do. We do a lot of great work at the lab, and that's, that's all because of the Department of Energy. So thank you to, to all of you.